And welcome to another episode of Businesses, Guys in Business, Boys and Girls, Small Moms and Pops, doesn't matter whether you're Fortune 500. Listen to today's show. If you're struggling with how to move forward, perhaps, in your career, regardless of whether you're in business or almost any other field, if you think about it, this book that we're featuring today in uh, the Reading Corner uh, is full of realistic action steps that show how to do just that. You see, your career is entirely in your hands. Uh, You don't want to let anyone convince you otherwise. You can keep an eye open for opportunity. Don't be afraid to take risks and realize that fear is the only thing holding you back from reaching your full potential. I'd like to welcome Norman Bacall. Hi, Norman. Mark, nice to be here. Norman Bacall is the author of this fabulous book. We're going to be talking about it in a moment. And the name of the book is Take Charge. You know, get on with the job. You take charge. But I want to uh, discuss a little bit about your background because you've been very successful. And, you know, there's a lot of people who write books, mate, haven't uh, even looked out the window, whereas you've been there, done it. And I think <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, after founding the uh, Toronto office of uh, Heenan Blakey back in, what, 1989, you went on to build and lead the law firm for a further 15 years Uh, in which time it became one of Canada's leading firms and you employed more than 1,100 people. That must have been uh, a great satisfaction to you. uh, Looking back on it, uh, definitely. Uh, Although when I moved uh, from Montreal to Toronto in 89, literally we opened a four-lawyer storefront uh, in downtown Toronto. So the notion that we would uh, ever grow into and become what we became was at, at the time unthinkable. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons uh, I went to do this was because I wanted something smaller and cozier. <laughs> right, right. Little, little did I know it was uh, the, the beginning or, or the, the first step of the rest of my life. And in particular, learning how to do things I had no clue how to do when I started. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, life takes you down a different path to what you think, but You know, I mean, you get to the pinnacle of your career and you're among the world's leading entertainment uh, attorneys representing major studios, helping finance Canadian films, television programs, and a number of Hollywood films. I mean, you made it, right? Uh, I made it. If uh, I suppose from that measure, absolutely. It was, uh, again, completely unimaginable uh, when I began. Uh, certainly when I began, when I when I left school, I was a, sort of a, an introverted student with, uh, with a good head on my shoulders, and that's pretty much all I had. But uh, the notion that, that I could go uh, toe-to-toe and have negotiations with, uh, with studio heads, with people who ran the finance departments at places like uh, MGM and Warner Brothers, where I spent an awful lot of time, uh, and ultimately as an advisor to Lionsgate uh, hmm. were things that early in my career would have been completely unthinkable. But yes, the, the, I, I had the rare opportunity to meet some extraordinary people in my life. Well, this episode, folks, uh, I'm speaking with author Norman Bacall, and it's about his clear and insightful book called Take Charge. You know, you take charge. Uh, taking charge faces the questions and challenges really about young professionals to build the skills uh, which will empower them towards professional success. We could all do with that one way or another. I mean, you can float along hoping everything works out, as Norman says, or you can take charge of your future beginning right now. And there are tools that you need to survive and to thrive. This is uh, what you say, Norman. Yes. uh, The the starting point of the thesis was to really go back go back in time to the beginning of my career and figure out what was it that nobody actively went out to teach me uh, and that still uh, skills that still really aren't being taught mm-hmm. uh, in schools, in schools or otherwise. And, you know, and, and I asked myself the question was a way, was there a way to, you know, was my, was my career experience a fluke or, or is it the process of some relatively, uh, simple ideas that needed to be followed that could be reproduced. Mm. And so that was my starting point. 
uh, and I had already written my memoir in, in, in my first book, which was called Breakdown. But uh, so I began to the exploration. So I, I went out and interviewed at least 20 other professionals um, and listened to their stories. And they were from all different walks of life. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the people I interviewed was an entrepreneur who arrived in Canada with no more than a shirt on his back as a 16-year-old from Jamaica. He'd grown up with his grandmother in one of these clapboard tin shacks. Mm -hmm. And he arrived here and became one of Canada's leading entrepreneurs. He now leads the Black North Initiative, which is an initiative across Canada um, to ensure that uh, people of color have uh, greater access uh, to Canadian boards of directors. And again, it's a, he's, he's fought uphill battles all his life. Yeah, bet but, he is. Uh, but really, so he was, he was among them. And, and what I was trying to set out to find out was, is there a common skill set that we had all developed? Is there a common pattern of thinking that we had developed? Or, or were we all just one-offs? Hmm. And, and the conclusion I came to was that pretty much all of us, regardless of where we started and what advantages we had at the beginning or disadvantages, uh, some, uh, some were actually poor students. Some were extraordinary students. And yet we all managed to succeed in different ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, what came out in my interviews is that the things that drove us and the, thing, the life lessons we learned along the way were pretty much the same. Yeah, so I'd, I decided, I'd, I'd go. Better write them down. <laughs> well, well let's, but speaking of that, what, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, young business professionals face today? And how would you suggest that they handle it? Well, the, the challenges are both challenges and exciting opportunities. And, and that deal, and, and it all starts with the rapid case of change that only... You know, we, I was saying this 15 years ago. I couldn't believe how fast things were moving. Mm -hmm. And yet, today, they seem to be moving at even a more rapid uh, pace, whether, whether it's technology, uh, uh, development of, of ideas that uh, you know, might have been unthinkable 10, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when you project forward to what the world may be like 10 years from now, it's almost unthinkable. Uh, what we may be looking at. But I find that that's actually a great equalizer because it means that uh, people with more business experience or more professional experience really don't have uh, uh, a huge leg up. And there's, for anybody who's innovative or who can see, uh, see the change coming or project it or is interested in that, there are so many unique opportunities uh, to move ahead and to take advantage. So if I was to ask you, you know, what, what motivated you to, to write a book that is not just about uh, business philosophy, but practical help for acquiring soft skills? It was a function of, I looked back and, and here I was, I was uh, uh, sort of at the pinnacle. I was this professional who had achieved extraordinary success I had former prime ministers of Canada working for my law firm. Uh, pretty much nothing I'd ever done had gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And the year after I re retired from management, the firm collapsed, uh, which was a, a blow that I had to recover from. It was sort of my entire identity was wrapped up into what I built. And, and there it was, you know, 14 months after I retired, it was gone. Good Lord. Yeah. Uh, and I decided that rather than, you know, curl up in a ball and mourn, uh, that I'd start writing. And the process of writing led me to understand that I, I, was, uh, I had a unique opportunity to give back to a business and professional community that had been so good to me. Mm -hmm. And the way I could give back would be to put down what I learned and see if I could pretty much pay it forward in the way. And when I started reflecting, uh, it wasn't just about my success, but it was about the help that I got along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it intended, some of it not intended, right. but from people who mentored and helped me or gave me, uh, you know, there's just the right word of advice on the day I needed it. Mm -hmm. And also to reflect upon the, the, uh, the fact that, that my success and it wasn't just 
success to success to success. In fact, there were challenges along the way. There were fears I had to get over. There, you know, fear of failure, oh, uh, yeah, the mistakes line. that I made along. Like there, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy path. And the one thing I wanted to let young people know was that when you know, you we have this this notion that when we see successful people, to think they're different than us. Right. They have something we don't have. And what I wanted to, to set out for, for everyone was that, no, that, that's not at all the case. The, the people who have made it, uh, per, perhaps the only thing that sets them apart is their determination to rise above every obstacle put in their way. Mm-hmm. And if you can understand that, and if you can adapt that to your own personality, you too can enjoy the success. So it's not that I'm smarter than you. It, it's uh, it, it's not that I'm luckier than you. It's not that I started off with with more opportunities than you. Mm-hmm. It's that there are a few simple things that I learned how to do that if you learn how to do them, you can have it too. All right. Well, you're going to get all of this out of the book called Take Charge with Norman Bacall, the author who I'm speaking with now. Uh, we've started this new segment called The Reading Corner. We've had some fabulous authors on. And my latest is Today with Norman. Now... Along with Joel Osteen, are there other uh, media personalities whose speaking styles have influenced you personally? Uh, well, the one who, who always jumps to mind, although he, he was more of a latecomer, is Barack Obama. And w- what I found he does is if you, if you actually study the pace of his speech, he speaks much more slowly uh, than most people do. And he pauses a lot. He's, he's a thoughtful speaker. But more important than the fact that he's thoughtful is that while he's speaking, and Joel Osteen does the same thing, he will make a point and then he'll pause and let it sink in. Mm-hmm. And, in and in that moment, and sometimes it's a few seconds, and, but it feels a lot longer. And in those moments, what he's doing is he's activating my mind to respond to what he said or to connect to a personal story. So he may be telling a personal story of his mm-hmm. and he'll pause along the way. And in that pause, I have a moment to think about how that's reflective of things that have happened to me. And, okay. and when I started, when I started studying the great speakers, the, the one thing I discovered was with their pacing, sometimes they slow down, sometimes they pick up, mm-hmm. sometimes they get very excited. And in doing that, what they're doing is creating an emotional experience for me. And we look and when you look at Obama's success, it's success that was achieved in a way I think I think most of his followers would say they didn't really understand. Except they they did feel an emotional connection to him. He mm-hmm. wasn't he wasn't just facts and figures and and figurehead. He was somebody you could connect to in your own way. You often mentor young business professionals. Uh, what character traits and qualities do you look for in, in the people that you choose to mentor? I look for only one, and that is determination. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting. When I, when I started practicing karate, and this goes back to my mid-30s, I was a late starter and terrible at the beginning. There was a plaque uh, when I walked into the karate dojo, and it said, and it's a, it, it's a translation from the Japanese, but what it said was, uh, regardless of the ne- number of years of practice, you will never advance without single-minded determination. Okay. It was still fairly early in my career, but I took that, and it stuck. It's now 30 years later. It stuck with me, and uh, and so that's so what I what I look for in in the people that I take on is a determination to succeed. They may not. They may not know how to do what to do. They may not know how to do it. But what I'm looking for is a determination to succeed. And that's some, you know, that's something uh, that you can work with. It's, it's, and it's a determination that doesn't matter what's standing in your way. You'll figure out, you'll figure out a way to go around it if you have to, go through it if you, if you need to. Although that tends to be, use the most amount of energy or, mm-hmm. or go over it. So which, but, of, you know, can I ask you then which of these factors is most important in in building a successful career: uh, natural intelligence, hard work, 
or good communication skills? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, uh, hard work. It's funny. People say, you know, the harder the work, the harder you work, the luckier you, you get. Yeah. I don't completely believe that. Neither do I. Don't I don't completely yeah. believe that. But um, because it, it's not about how hard you work. In some, in some respects, it's about how smart you work uh, and how effective you are and understanding, understanding where you are and where you want to be. Uh, much more than simply driving through the pile of work. It's understanding why you're doing it and what you're going to get out of it. And why is that so? so? It's, it's, because there's there's a lesson in everything. It's and and this will take me you know to one of my central cores, and that is, uh, you'll find that the people who succeed, generally speaking, are not the ones with the most natural talent. Uh, because when you have the natural talent, things come to, come to you easily. And in order to succeed, uh, things things need to come to you <laughs> not easily at all. You, you need to be you need to be fighting with them a little bit. So the people who can can fight through those moments, right, uh, uh, are more likely to succeed. But you also mentioned communication, and and I think the reality is uh, the people who develop the best communication skills are the most likely to succeed. And I say develop because uh, I don't think they're they're probably like everything else. They're an exceptional few mm. who are great who come out of the womb, great communicators, uh, and the rest of us have to learn it the hard way. <laughs> and and the the one thing because I, when we think about communication, what are we, the first thing that comes to mind is you know how well can I give a speech? How how flowery or ornate is my writing? Mm. Mm. And the reality is. You know, the most important communication skill you have if you're going to succeed in business and in life mm -hmm. is your ability to listen. Because it isn't about you. It's about the person you're serving or dealing with. Right. And it's right. about listening, listening to their perspective, their perception, and dealing with that as opposed to, you know, listen to how smart I am and let me convince you of that. It's, if you're going to succeed, it, you, you have to turn it on its head and it's, how well am I able to listen to what your problems are so that I can help you solve them? Well, I've got a few lessons, uh, a few questions, I should say, that I want to get through before we wrap <laughs> up. In the book, you say, look, if you're personally aligned with the firm's values, you're far more likely to enjoy going to work every day. So how does a professional find a firm that aligns with their personal values? First, apart from anything else, you have to do your homework. And you have to listen carefully. So, so how many of us you know, go to a job interview, meet one person, and then take the job? You're taking a risk. Because what's, what's, imp what's most important to understand is who you are and what drives you and when, you're, when you're trying to decide where to work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if, if you're uh, a hard-headed person, you like to argue, you're probably much better off in a – in working in a workplace where other people are just like you and you're going to fit it right in because if you go to a place where everyone is accommodating and you're the person who likes to argue things out, people are going to look at you. They're going to see you as different and they may see you as too aggressive. You're and, and you, whether you're conscious of it or, or not conscious of it are going to know you just don't fit. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of that. So but if you, I yeah, experienced so a lot of that in my early homework. days. Yep. There, there is people are scared stiff to ask questions, scared stiff to put their hand up, uh, you know, scared stiff to change the status quo. Um, unbelievable. But anyway, there are many, many business and self-career help books out there, Norman, on the market. You know that. What do you think, in all honesty, sets take charge apart from these books? Well, point one, uh, it was written by somebody who did it rather than somebody who just observed other people doing it. Being there, and done that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's no replacing experience as a teacher. So, so, so I think that's part of it. Second, it's written in a way that makes it, I think, plain that it doesn't matter where you started or where you are today. Mm -hmm. you're, you pick this up, you're going to benefit from it. So it's not about uh, it's not about the next fad. It's not about something radical has changed in the last five years that 
changes the whole way we see business and relationships. No, it's 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 actually kind of old fashioned. Mm-hmm. It 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 breaks it down into here's what worked for me, here's what is current has worked for and is currently work working for at least twenty others. So you you've got a, a pretty good sampling of experience, and here here are the common threads, and then in pretty simple English. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm not I'm not going into a lot of scientific theory for you. What I'm doing is telling you here, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, your business life or your professional life is going to improve. It's really as simple as that. And it's worked for all of us. Well, you say, you know, I, I wish I could tell you there's a panacea that allows you to have a life <laughs> while you're practicing law, for instance, or any other profession. But each of you will have to determine what guides your choices. What tough choices Mm -hmm. have you had to make along the way and what principles helped guide you in those? That's because there's no magic bullet. And the uh, the other thing that that I try and make clear is everybody's definition of success is going to be personal. And really what I want is to give you some tools for you to make some improvement in your life. Mm-hmm. And and your and what will work for you is going to be di- necessarily is going to be different than what worked for me. That's right. To each their own. Per se. You're a different person. Yeah, you yeah. A different strength. For some, it's the big house and the flash car and the, you know, the memberships <laughs> and all of this. Others are just achieving what they ever went after. That's their goal of success. You know. That's right. So my go- my goal is not to my goal is not to change who you are. My goal is to take who you are, and say okay here are five things that you can do to improve what you want out of, out of your life. So let me and ask you this. It, it can very well be different than what I wanted. No, fair enough. How do cross-disciplinary insights then, I mean, such as your early experiences with sales or your karate practice, strengthen and equip the business leader? I mean, the one thing I, I discovered and that we all discovered is that it isn't about your book smarts and it's, and your university experience and even the first few years of practice uh, don't really uh, equip you with enough skills to succeed. So for me, who became a lawyer because I figured, okay, that way I'll never have to sell because the the idea that I, that I was ever going to sell, sell anything was actually pretty frightening. Uh, <laughs> What I discovered was ultimately it's all about sales, but sales in fact, isn't as scary as it appears. Um, yeah. it, it's, you know, sales is about, it, it's about two things. It's about developing confidence in yourself. Uh, and particularly for professionals, the product you're selling is you it's trust in you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but, but nobody taught me that in law school. <laughs> like nobody even nobody ever told me that period i had to figure that out for myself you know the one thing i would i would say and i say it in the book uh is that you know, the most important thing i ever did in the course of my career was sell vacuum cleaners <laughs> because i had to eat while i was a law student putting my pulling my putting myself through school uh, yeah and that was a pretty scary experience but once i saw i could do it once i learned how to do it mm-hmm. uh that became a skill that was of huge value to the entire rest of my life. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe a more important skill than anything I learned in law school. Well, you see, I was going to say the fact is, depending on your discipline and the way, if you were a defense lawyer, I mean, you've got to stand up there in court and you've got to sell. One way or another, you're selling. You know, so yes, you're selling. And it, <laughs> the one thing I tell I tell litigation lawyers is that you know you have to remember. Judges are people, and like all people, mm-hmm. they understand they understand things much easier when you put it in, in the form of a story, mm-hmm. as opposed to legal words that really nobody can understand. Right, right. And uh, so, learning storytelling skills uh, is probably more, again, more important than what they're going to learn in law school, or in fact, you know, and and, and that goes not just for not just for lawyers, but pretty much any, anybody in anything. It's, it's easier to sell your, yourself when you're telling a story. My final question for you. What great lesson do you hope readers will learn from reading your brand new book, Take Charge? 
uh, I want them to learn, you know, it's, it's funny. I'll close, close this, uh, with a, with a lesson I learned from my uncle Harry. And he was on his deathbed at the time. I was only 19 years old, so I couldn't really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But what he said was, uh, just remember your career is a river and you're going to put that boat in the river and you have a choice. You can either set your sight on something and fight the current to get there, or you can get in the boat, take the current and just grab at the opportunities as they come by. Mm. on your boat and what you're what you'll what you'll find is you've expended far less energy and that boat will take you places you could never have imagined yeah and that was my career that's that a great that's a great career. analogy i like that that's my career too to be honest with you just go with the flow what's meant to be will come go out with the flow keep your eyes open mm -hmm. uh you know and 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 don't say no don't be don't be frightened and don't say no to new opportunities if you say yes you're far more likely to grow. The book is Take Charge. It's written by, well, actually, Take Charge, The Skills That Drive Professional Success. And it's by Norman Bacall. And available where now? It's just about, uh, well, Amazon for sure, and Barnes & Noble, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it's on uh, iBooks. It's even if you want to... Uh, if you want to order the audio version, it's uh, on iTunes. It's coming soon to Audible. Oh, they seem to be very slow. Uh, <laughs> you can also you can also check it and my other books out on my website, which is Norman Bacall, B A C A L dot com, as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you can learn all about all my other books, including the fictions. Oh, fabulous, <laughs> fabulous! Now, when you spoke of audio, uh, audio uh, audible books, did you record that yourself? I did. Mm. I did. One more thing that I had to learn that I had no clue what I was doing when I started. <laughs> I had to record it three times before I got it right. There you go. <laughs> but I did it myself. There you there go. We well, go. good job. And hopefully well, you'll like it. <laughs> good job. Well done. I think you still learn everything to the grave, my friend. You never stop learning, do you? You know. I certainly hope so. Keep well, it's on. been an absolute pleasure, Norman. Thank you for giving me the time in the Reading Corner in the Mark Bishop Show. Take Charge by Norman Bacall. And, of course, you know, you're going to get at skills that drive professional success. Uh, what you're going to do is read the darn thing. <laughs> Have a good <laughs> life. Take care. All right? Thank you, Mark. You All too. right. Goodbye now.